We welcome you to Easter Meadows today. It's wonderful to see you. And let me say this, come back. If you're visiting, we hope that you come back at every opportunity. But a special invitation for May the 7th, first Sunday in May. We are having homecoming and combining that with goal day. And we have a goal of 300. And frankly, 300 will be a great challenge for us. And so we hope that you will be a part of that number to help us reach that 300. But we're so glad that you're here today and invite you to stay and eat with us. We have a meal prepared. It's always good. And there'll be a meal May the 7th as well. So if you can come that day, plan on staying and being our guest. It's a special Sunday in various ways, but one way is it's the first Sunday that Raylan is here with us today. And, uh, you know, earlier I heard a baby crying, and I wasn't sure we've got two or three babies here. And I hope that Raylan will come to love church, um, and so that crying won't be the thing that she thinks of when she comes to church. But let's uh, have a word of prayer for Kelsey, her mom, and for Raylan, the new baby. Father in heaven, we're thankful, mindful of all the blessings you give us, especially thankful for the spiritual blessings in Christ, thankful for grace, for mercy, for your love. We're thankful for the cross and the blood that was shed there. And Father, we're thankful too that there is a new baby in our midst, and we do pray for Raylan, we pray for her physically, that she'll grow and be healthy. We also pray that Kelsey, her mom, will have the intention, I want to see my little girl become one day a faithful Christian, and that that will be her full intention, and so she will raise her in that manner. We ask you to bless Kelsey as mom. We ask you to bless Mark and Tammy as grandparents. Such a joy to have a grandchild. And we pray that you'd bless them as they have their part in her becoming one day what we'd hope to see, a faithful Christian. And Father, we ask you to bless all the moms and dads here, all the grandmas and grandpas, that each of us, that regardless of anything else, we want to see that child be a faithful Christian. And that's all that really matters. There's a lot of things that can kind of sidetrack us, a lot of things that grab our attention. We pray we'd never lose sight of the goal of that child becoming a faithful Christian. Father, we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Job. I'll not be speaking tonight, and I wanted to continue with the study of Job so that hopefully next week we could finish that study up. We've been studying Job as our lads to leaders are studying Job, as well as other books in their preparation for Bible Bowl at Lads to Leaders Convention. And that is soon going to be here. And while I hope to have finished Job by that time, We'll not even get started with uh, Ruth and Esther, which are other studies that they've had. Of course, as you go back and remember Job, you remember how he is described in chapter 1. He is blameless and upright and one that feared God. This was the kind of man he was, but it was also recognized by God, and God calls attention to Job as this kind of man. And that's when Satan says, well, kind of let me at him. You know, you have put this hedge around him. You've, you've kind of made it profitable for him to be good. Uh, let me take away some of these goodies you've given him. And let's see then. And God allows it. And within the reports of three consecutive servants... Basically, all his wealth is gone. All his livestock dead. And then the fourth servant comes in. And all of his sons and daughters are dead. I can imagine each successive report was somewhat upsetting. 
But I cannot imagine somebody walking in and saying, all of your sons and daughters are dead. The only thing left, well, at this point, his body is intact, he's healthy, and his wife is still living. That's about it. And if you find, what does he do? He worships God. But Satan's like, uh, no, you didn't let me touch him. Let me touch him. And we'll see what he does then. And Satan is allowed to touch his body, and so sores or boils come up upon his body, and physically, then, he's miserable. Mentally, emotionally, physically, he's miserable. Three friends come. These three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, sit with him for seven days, say nothing. That's probably when they did their most good, because when they began to speak, what they speak spoke was not comforting or helpful, but in fact, very frustrating to Job. And then Job would give an answer. And so we had studied through the first round of speeches because, you see, they continued to speak until you finally get towards the end of the book, and then they've had their say. And then we read about Elihu, and Elihu then makes a speech. Elihu's younger but it seems in this case, Elihu's probably wiser than these three older friends. And an interesting thing is, while Job always replied to these three friends, after Elihu had finished, Job does not make a reply. And then, as we are now studying what God is saying... As you get towards the very end, you find God has something to say to those three friends but not to Elihu. It seems that probably Elihu was more on point than those three friends were. Well, we had begun to study last week at what God had to say. And I have to say with regards to this book, it's kind of exciting then to read. Here's what God said, not just now one of the three friends, not just Job. Because the reality is, they are not speaking from full understanding and knowledge. God is, of course. And so as you read some of the things that they say, that it's inspired, the writer's inspired. That they said it, yes. But they may or may not be right all the time. But when God speaks, we know it's right. Now we have an understanding. Well, he's been confronting Job. In fact, we find in chapter 39, uh, actually 38, he begins with what comes to be about 70-plus rapid-fire questions. And most all of these questions kind of have the same answer. Uh, Job would have to say, no, God, I can't do that. And God, I know it's you that does that. You have the power. I don't. That could almost summarize answers in most cases of these questions that God asked Job we kind of got towards the middle of that as we looked at the end of chapter 38 last week. Now, chapter 38, much of it has to do with God and, can we just say this, the weather and God's in charge and control. Job's not. And then he moves from that part of nature to another, to, to animals. And he mentions in chapter 38, he begins that. Verse 39, can you hunt the prey for the lion? Or verse 41, who provides for the raven its prey? It's so the lion, the raven. Now verse 1 of chapter 39. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? 
Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill kind of the gestation period? And do you know the time when they give birth? And then in verse 4, the young ones become strong. And he says, do you know? Job would be forced to say, no, I don't know. But I know, God, that you know. And the young ones become strong. It's you that have made them strong. Then he moves on in verse 5. Who has let the wild donkey go free? And so some questions about the wild donkey. And once again, the answer is, it's God, not Job. He mentions in verse 9, is the wild ox willing to serve you? So he moved to a different creature. Now most scholars believe that this wild ox refers to a large, fierce ox of the ancient world that is now extinct. Now the King James Version, if you're reading that, you might see the word unicorn, and that's not really a good translation, unicorn. But there's a reason for it. The Septuagint version, that was the translation from Hebrew to Greek. The Greek word chosen by those translators was monocharis, which could be defined as one horn. And then the King James translators, they kind of followed that tradition from the Septuagint, thinking one-horned animal, unicorn. But no, uh, wild ox would be a better translation. And he begins to say several things about this wild ox. But once again, the question, Job, did you you create it? Did you sustain it? Can you tame it? You see, Job comes up short. But God is again proved to be the Almighty. Almighty. And then verse 13, the wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but, are, but they are the pinions and plumage of love. For she leaves her eggs to the earth. Now here some interesting things are said about the ostrich. And it mentions about the eggs. And to me the interesting thing was it, it mentions it, and then if you were to go read about the ostrich, you find that, yes, that's exactly what they do. But then there's a reason for it that, you know, kind of on the outside looking in, might not quite understand. That is all these eggs laid. In fact, uh, maybe 30 or more. And, And here they are, but yet some might get trampled on, as if, Mama, you didn't watch after your eggs good enough. Well, that kind of design was that not all the eggs survive, and then the hatchlings would eat of those eggs that don't survive. In other words, there was design here with this. And did Job design and plan this? Absolutely not. Then in verse verse 18 it says, When she rouses herself to flee. Now, This word flee is kind of one of those Hebrew words that when the scholars are making their translation kind of scratch their head and say, we're not sure what that word means. There's a number of Hebrew words that way, and this is one of them. The King James Version has the word high, rouses herself high. But... The ESV says to flee, and then it says she laughs at the horse and his rider. Somebody might say, I don't quite get the point there. He is describing here the magnificence of the ostrich. Okay, I've seen one at the zoo, and you probably have too. But I have never seen an ostrich run, and if we did, apparently, we would be quite impressed. In fact... All you need to do is Google. You can put, how fast is an ostrich in Google, and you know what you come up with? 43 miles per hour. 
They can run that fast. And then you type in, how fast can a horse run? And there's quite variations on that, but generally about 25 to 30 miles an hour, and at its very fastest in sprint, maybe 50. In other words, generally, the ostrich can outrun a horse. Now, if some horse lover is in here thinking, I'm putting down horses, I'm not. In fact, we're going to then read what he says about the horse because it's kind of majestic in the way it's worded. But here, this ostrich, whether the way he lays his eggs or how fast he can run, Job didn't create it, Job didn't make it, Job didn't design it, it was God. Then in verse 19, he mentions the horse. He said, do you give the horse his might? Let's just read these verses. And think of the horse, or maybe even specifically the war horse. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunders and the captains and the shoutings. I just find it beautiful how he describes the horse. But it all comes down to this, Job. Did you give the horse its might? Did you clothe his neck with the mane? In other words, once again, Job comes up short. It's God the Almighty that's done this. Now in verse 26, he mentions the hawk, how the hawk soars. And then he mentions wings toward the south, probably the reference is to migration. Verse 27, he mentions the eagles. The eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high. I read that eagles have been sighted at as high as 10,000 feet. And then in verse 29, there he spies out the prey. His eyes behold them from afar off. Did you know an eagle can see a rabbit from nearly two miles away? You know, when somebody says eagle eye, it really does mean something. An eagle see a rabbit at two miles away, and here's recorded the magnificence of the eagle. And the whole idea of this is an humbling experience for Job. For no, he's not in any shape, form, or fashion on a plane with the Almighty. And then that's when he gets more personal. Look at chapter 40. Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. That's like Job... Do you want to continue your complaint against me? Do you think you can answer the case that I have just presented? Now, you realize that when you read about Job's suffering, it is extraordinary. And as far as we know, now, he maintains his integrity, doing right. But as you read some of the things that Job says, and I say this, says about God. As I've read this, I'm thinking, Job, I don't think I'd be saying that. For instance, in chapter 13, verse 22, then call, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and you reply to me. He's talking to God. In essence, he's saying, God, I want to make my case 
before you. Chapter 31, verse 35, he says, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. He's making these statements about God the Almighty as if he's going to contend with the Almighty God. And so God's now answering him. Then in verse 3, Job answered, back to chapter 40, verse 3, Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? He's been humbled. He had wanted to make his case. Now he's got nothing to say. Then he says, I lay my hand on my mouth. You know when we look at somebody and do like this? You know what we mean by that? Kind of be silent, be quiet. The idea of him laying his hand on his mouth is to, to, to say, I'll be quiet. I'm silenced. You've silenced me. Job has been humbled, and you will keep quiet. And so then we see more of things that the Lord says. Look in verse 8. Will you put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you be in the right? You see... When you read of some of the things that Job said, like I said, I'd be kind of, Job, I don't think I'd say that. God's now answering. And in fact, this seemed to be the problem that Elihu had with Job is, is how he wasn't giving God so much the glory, rather seemingly the blame. Verse 9, have you an arm like God, arm the idea of strength. Then in verse 10, adorn yourself. Adorn yourself. But look what he says. Adorn yourself. It's like clothe yourself. With majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. Look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. And you know, he might be scratching our heads. What's he saying here? It's almost like if God were saying to Job, why don't you play God for a while? In other words, you be the majestic one, the dignified one. You have the say-so on, on men. Only if you're able to do this, look at verse 14, then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. Only if you can do these things. You, only if you can do like I do. Well, I then acknowledge you that, that you have a right to speak these things. Then he moves on <clears throat> to another creature. Verse 15, behold behemoth. And you know, as we look at that, we kind of scratch our heads and say, behemoth what's a behemoth well one interesting thing is that it's this word this Hebrew word is the plural of beast but somebody says I don't see it plural here uh, but in the context you see it is used with singular verbs and pronouns the plural I think would indicate somewhat the intensity the 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 idea of it's a great beast. And then see how it's described. Well, it's a vegetarian, thankfully. Eats grass like an ox. Verse 16, strength in its loins is very strong. Verse 17, makes its tail stiff or moves like a cedar. Okay, some people have said, well, maybe this was an elephant. Some people have said, well, maybe this was a hippopotamus. But okay, consider the tail like a cedar. A cedar tree. And now, does that like the tail of a, an elephant or a tail of a hippopotamus? You know, not at all. In fact, we even see further 
The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, light, limbs like bars of iron. One big and strong creature. Somebody says, well, what is this behemoth? Honestly, I think he's talking about one of the very large dinosaurs. And the reason that most people, if they would refuse to think that way, is probably because they've taken an evolutionary view of creation, thinking that there was these millions and billions of years, and during part of this time, eventually, dinosaurs ruled the earth, they finally died off, and then man appeared. But no. I'm sorry, but that's not the Bible picture. And the reality is that back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, as the creation is pictured, the creation of all things take place in that creation week, which would make, yes, the dinosaurs co-inhabitants of this world with man. Behemoth, likely the dinosaur. But then as he sums it all up, look in verse 24. Can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? It's kind of like saying he's so powerful that man cannot capture him. And he's going back with an idea of understand this Job. You may have been that upright man, that blameless man, and the man that feared God, but you are just a man. And you're not on the plane, you're not an equal with God. Can't really question, contend with God. You know, I would hope that as we read this, we walk away realizing God, the Almighty. We'd walk away thinking, God, our Creator. God, the great designer. For when he mentions all of these creatures, no, it's not Job that made them, but it's God. And then the things that he says indicates the idea of design. Indicates the intelligence of the creator. The idea of purpose and intent with creation. Kind of walk away thinking, yes, God the Almighty, God the creator. And then also walk away with man. The creature. Man. Also one of the creation. Man. Let's try to live so that we are upright and blameless and fear God. But even then, we're still just men. And we need to acknowledge God as the Almighty. Give Him the praise, give Him glory. But oh, by the way, as we close, look towards an invitation. Yes, we're one of His creation. But we're not just any of his creation. We are the one that was made in his image after his likeness. We are the one that we read of God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We've read a lot of, about a lot of animals and it's to me been interesting to see the, maybe the speed of the ostrich. Or maybe see the, the idea of the, an, an eagle seeing a rabbit two miles away. Or, or the behemoth, this great creature that we would maybe assume to be a dinosaur. God's son didn't die for any of those. And there's no plans for any of those creatures after this life is over. But as God has put within man a spirit... And in that way, we're 
after his image and likeness. When this life ends, you see, something lives on. But where will it be? Where will it live on? Heaven or hell? And it's for this reason. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we respond to that message in faith, believing it, turning from our sin, that's repentance, to confess our faith, and then to be baptized, immersed for the forgiveness of sins, and then to live, try to live a faithful life. And like Job, be upright and blameless and fear God. If we could assist you with your obedience this morning, please.